It is Easter. <laughs> uh, the marvelous, marvelous story of Easter is always the same. Jesus has risen. He is alive. In spite of 2,000 years of history and literally thousands of books and studies that have been done concerning Jesus' resurrection, there are still people in the world who actually deny it. But the evidence, both physical and spiritual, says that it is true. Uh, still, there are non-believers, <laughs> along with the Discovery Channel, for example, who are still looking for an ossuary box somewhere in Jerusalem with Jesus' bones. But needless to say, uh, there were many people named Jesus in the first century because it was the Latin name for Joshua, uh, one of the preferred names among the, among the Jewish people. Uh, there was even a tomb found in 2007 somewhere in Jerusalem that said uh, had on the, on the ossuary box, family of Jesus, uh, which of course uh, many people proclaimed a sure evidence that uh, Jesus did not rise from the dead. But our best and most extensive history of Jesus' life and death and resurrection and ascension are, of course, for us found in the Scripture, which has uh, been probably the most accurately confirmed ancient record in existence and certainly the most studied in all the world. Uh, th but there was no doubt in the, in the mind of the early disciples. Uh, there was no doubt in the, <laughs> in the mind of the angels who appeared. And there was certainly no doubt in the mind of the Roman guards uh, who, who uh, actually saw the angel and were frightened to death. Uh, there was uh, apparently no doubt among even the Jewish leaders uh, because the fact is that uh, some were made eternal liars about his resurrection, while others went out to change the world and to change history. Uh, because they went out assuring the faithful that spiritual rebirth and eternal life uh, in God's glory is the future existence of all of those who yield their spirit to this great truth of the victory of the resurrection. And it is by God's power, not by ours, nor by nature. It is God's power, and it is our sure hope of salvation. Paul says that if his death and resurrection are not real, then we are in miserable shape. And if these things aren't real, then we might as well go out and eat, drink, and be merry because only death awaits us. But uh, through all the gospel writers, uh, they all report this as wonderful news. And our scripture selected today for this lesson is from Matthew's report of the resurrection. And it's in uh, his very last chapter chapter 28, and we'll read uh, verses 1 to 10, as well as the verses 16 to 20, where Jesus gives us what we know of as the Great Commission. But the story of the betrayal by Judas, and all of the injustices, and all of the abuse heaped on Jesus, uh, as well as uh, as all the other things that are documented, both in Scripture and as well as in some secular writers and some Jewish writers who were contemporary with Jesus, uh, leaves little doubt about uh, the facts of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, even, even though Pilate uh, at first apparently wanted to release Jesus, uh, nevertheless, after the condemnation, the treatment of the condemned became inhuman. And this was a fairly common practice in those days. And uh, we'll not look at all of the details of his death right now. All of the Gospels 
give us details of this terrible death with tears. Uh, even a hardened centurion at the cross confessed, uh, after watching all that occurred, uh, particularly the dignity of his, of his death, the darkened sky, the earthquake, and other strange unnatural occurrences that were talked that were told about, uh, finally confessed at the end, this was the Son of God. But uh, we'll begin our study of the verses today with uh, at verse four of Matthew chapter twenty-eight, and uh, or verses one through four. Excuse me. Verses, the first four verses of uh, chapter 28. I'll read those. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Uh, we, we, we read those words, it's, uh, it, must have, it must have been quite an emotional time that morning early. Uh, the women who came to the tomb early in the morning were taking aromatic spices to anoint the body of Jesus, they did not realize that Joseph and Nicodemus uh, had already taken care of that particular task in the burial, as they were uh, certainly surrounded by Roman guards and the temple officials. Uh, there was no doubt in anybody's mind about the fact that he was dead and that he was put in that tomb. Uh, Oh, when we when we mention Marys, there there are about six different Marys mentioned in the New Testament, uh, but uh, we're fairly sure about these two that are mentioned here. One, of course, of course, Mary Magdalene. The other was probably Mary, the mother of James and John, because she seemed to be close to all of them. As a matter of fact, it's probable that she was Jesus' aunt. Uh, she had stayed by his mother during the crucifixion, uh, and apparently before the women had arrived at the tomb, uh, the earthquake and the stone had been rolled away. Uh, there was an early morning earthquake. <laughs> uh, interestingly, that seems to be uh, one of God's favorite ways of getting our attention. Remember, uh, Peter was in jail, and uh, the Lord uh, sent an earthquake, and shook the jail. Paul and Silas were in the jail in Philippi, and they also had a shaking experience there. Uh, and of course, uh, we're told that in the, in the moment of Jesus' death, that the temple itself was shaken. And uh, so we, uh, we see that uh, now, this morning, a mighty angel made sport <laughs> of a sealed tomb and just sat down on top of the stone which he had removed. Uh, and, and certainly his, his appearance was something to behold. He looked like living lightning. Uh, and yet, uh, in spite of that, you could see that he was wearing beautiful white garments. So uh, it was such a spectacular event that even these tough Roman and Jewish guards passed out from fear. Uh, we, we are reminded of several uh, Old Testament passages where uh, when, the, uh, when the recipient of a visit from an angel uh, simply faded away and, with, and lost all strength and fell on his face. And so uh, these, these fellows just passed out from sheer fear. Uh, it, would, it would be interesting to know uh, all that they saw that morning that was so impressive that they actually fell down as dead men. Apparently, Jesus had already gone from the tomb when the angel rolled the stone away. Uh, Jesus would certainly uh, not need any help getting out. Uh, and uh, then we, we move quickly to the women's arrival and uh, their encounter with the angel 
after the earthquake and all that had happened uh, very early that morning. And perhaps by the time the women got there, the angel had sort of toned down his, his appearance a little uh, for them because it uh, seemed that he was sitting comfortably on top of the rock when, when they arrived with an open tomb before them. And uh, he began to talk to the ladies. I'll read those verses, 5, 6, and 7 of uh, chapter 28. And so the angel said to the women, Don't be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He's not here, for he is risen. Just as he said, Come and see the place where he was lying. And then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. And then, behold, I have told you. It's interesting that angels do not mince words when they speak to human beings, uh, nor do they engage in small talk. Uh, we do not know this angel's name. Actually, we only know a few angels by name. We know of Lucifer uh, and, and, his, and his demise as a principal angel. We know of Gabriel, who talked to Daniel and to Mary. Uh, we don't ever meet Michael, but we hear about Michael, the archangel, the angel that is protecting Israel. And there's a fallen angel mentioned called Abaddon. Now, this angel that was sitting on the, on the stone, uh, his first words were comforting as well as assuring. He says that he certainly understands their concern, and he assures them that uh, the one who was crucified is the same one who is now risen. Besides, uh, uh, he, he even told you that he was going to rise. And so once an angel says a thing like that, it's almost like, why are you even questioning it? He said it. <laughs> it has to happen. Uh, then with courtesy, he invites them to see the place where Jesus had lain. And uh, once they had seen that, he says, uh, you are now to go and to tell the rest of the disciples uh, what you found here. He also reminded them that, uh, again, that Jesus was really alive. And he reminded them again of the plan that they were to meet Jesus in Galilee, in Galilee of the Gentiles. Uh, and he had emphasized again that Jesus would be seen. Uh, the angel insists, then, listen carefully what I've told you. I have said it, and it is true. Uh, the angel then is completing his obligations to the very letter of his divine orders. And this seems to be a characteristic of the, of the angels. Every time they appear, they, uh, they have no small talk. They do, not, they do not mince their words. They say exactly what they were sent to, to say or to do. Now, the women themselves immediately began to do their part. <laughs> uh, they hurried off toward the hiding place. Now, I'm sure there was a terrible mixture of emotions that morning. They were still probably overwhelmed with fear, but also with joy as they start running back to tell the others. And suddenly they were confronted by the Lord himself. Was Jesus teasing them? Uh, I can only imagine the emotion that sent their faces straight to the ground. Uh, and again, here's the word of comfort from heaven. This time it was from the king himself. He said, don't be afraid. Uh, but again, he gave the order, get up and get with the rest and head for Galilee. He said, I will meet them there. I'll meet all of you there. Now, we don't know quite about all the time involved here. There may have been some lapse of time uh, that we don't really know about because we find that they were together the following week still in Jerusalem. 
And so they did not get to Galilee for almost 10 days from the time of the crucifixion. Uh, were they afraid to be seen? Uh, it may be that. They were staying in a locked up place in Jerusalem, uh, apparently a hiding place. Uh, did, did the Jewish leaders seek to kill all of them? They seem to have been afraid that they were going to be killed. Uh, we, have, we really have no idea wh about why there was this delay. But when they got together in Galilee, uh, it's certain that there were more than the 11. The 11 went, of course, but it was probably there where some 500 people came together to see him and to assure themselves that he was risen. Uh, and uh, there were many who had followed and believed Jesus in Galilee. And of course, everyone in Jerusalem knew the whole story. It was going around town. There was no CNN or newspapers nor, nor broadcast stations, but uh, by word of mouth, word of was getting around Jerusalem rapidly about what had happened. And, uh, but so we will, we'll, for our lesson, we'll skip the two, we'll skip the two appearances we know about in Jerusalem and go directly to Galilee for our final verses for today. And uh, those are verses 16 through 20, in which Jesus comes with his, close to the 11 and gives them some specific orders. I'll begin to, I'll read those. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, within, within a few days, uh, we do find the disciples in Galilee of the Gentiles uh, to that particular appointed place. We also know that they met him on the side of the seashore at one time while they were there. But when he appeared, most recognized him and worshipped I would assume that that would have been the, the 11, but some of the other people there probably were among those who were doubtful because the 11 had already seen him. They had heard him talk. They had watched him eat, uh, but there were some who still had doubts. Uh, and perhaps this is why Jesus wanted to show up with the witnesses in Galilee of the Gentiles because he was going to make quite a statement here that they were to proclaim the gospel to every nation, to all peoples, uh, regardless uh, of all of the motivations involved here. It's here in the Galilee of the Gentiles that he gives this great commission concerning the making of disciples of people of all nations. Uh, he first establishes that through this process of the saving grace of the Heavenly Father and the power, uh, which is evidence that, uh, that he has now authority over life and death, and now he proclaims that all power and all authority has been put into his hands, all of it, uh, everything in heaven and everything on earth. He's claiming his kingdom now. <laughs> To these disciples, he's, he's making his, his claim to the kingdom. Uh, the apostles uh, are to begin the process of proclaiming this truth to all the world. And then the believers of all ages are to continue to do this. And then he promises his eternal presence with all of those who are making disciples. So these, are, these are pretty fabulous words. Uh, this is the great message of Easter. It's for sure. He is alive. He is alive forevermore. Truth is proclaimed. Jesus is risen. And we are risen. For he says, 
Whoever believes in me has eternal life. He will not taste death. Uh, and uh, so uh, let me read that last command again. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Wow. <laughs> As we uh, look at some uh, conclusions from, uh, from these brief verses, uh, I have listed a few here. One is that the tomb is forever empty. It could not hold him. It cannot hold us. And number two, the testimony of an empty tomb was confirmed by at least three angels uh, sent from God's very throne. Uh, the one that was sitting there, <laughs> and on, on one, once there seemed to be two of them, but uh, then uh, we find that uh, they are confirming the fact that this tomb is empty, that Jesus Christ is risen. He is victorious over death. And number three, uh, the resurrection of Jesus was confirmed by hundreds who saw him die and also saw him alive later. So his, his death and resurrection were, were well confirmed by the people who lived in his day. And number four, uh, the uh, the effect on the millions who have believed this this proclamation that he died on a cross on our behalf and that he rose victorious from the grave uh, tends to confirm this truth. It has been believed. It has changed the lives of millions of people uh, through two thousand years now. That's a pretty strong confirmation of it being true. And number five, if Jesus is who he said he is, then he certainly did not lie. Uh, he proclaimed that he would die, and he did. He proclaimed that he would rise from the dead, and he did. And he assumed his place. Uh, it's amazing when we get to the very end of the, of the New Testament, uh, in the book of the Revelation of Jesus, the, in chapter 11, when the seventh angel sounded his trumpet in heaven, all of heaven shouted, the kingdom of this world, the kingdoms of this world, have become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Uh, let's hear that again. When the seventh angel sounded his trumpet in heaven, all of heaven shouted, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Come, Lord Jesus, come for us. Lord, we thank you so much for this, for this part of the history uh, that uh, gives us hope eternal. And we just thank you, Lord, for your love to us and for the sacrifices made and for what Easter means to all of us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.